so this is our first master class of this year year 2022 and uh, your enthusiastic involvement uh, uh, in each session as well as overwhelming response uh, thereafter uh, has motivated us to ensure this financial literacy uh, initiative continues going forward also so today uh, we have a very interesting uh, topic uh, timing the market versus focusing on compounding and cash flows so uh, if you remember couple of months back we have taken a session on macroeconomic investing and that macroeconomic investing talks about uh, timing the market always right it, it talks about uh, using a lot of macro parameters to decide when to go underweight overweight in the market so these are very different school of thoughts and our objective is to uh, debate and get more and more perspective on each of these uh, thought processes in investing so as a investor we are aware that what we are doing is it a right thing or a wrong thing to do so uh, again i i personally feel that catching the tops and bottom is a myth even a seasoned investor like warren buffet believes uh, time in the stock market is more important although no short shot formula has yet been discovered for success in stock market but today we have a, a well known fund manager who will share his golden rules with all of us so let me welcome mr rakshit ranjan he is a btech from iit delhi he is a cfa charter holder began his career uh, covering uk equity in lloyds bank for 6 years during his period he he was ranked among the top 3 uk analyst in the mid cap mid cap space since 2011 rakshit led ambit capital consumer research franchise which has got it number 1 for the discretionary consumer research he launched ambit's coffee can pms in march 2017 one of the uh, india's top performing equity products du during 2018 now rakshit is a leading fund manager at marcellus investment managers rakshit has also co-authored two books on investing coffee can investing uh, uh, and diamond in the dust so which is consistent compounder for extraordinary wealth creation in 2021 so rakshit welcome to uh, tbng's master class we are excited to have you and look forward to get a lot of uh, wealth creation nuggets from you before i hand over to rakshit two uh, pointers to all of you that as the session progresses post your questions in the comments column and we will try our best to address them in the q and a round you will receive a feedback form at the end of the session so kindly share your valuable feedback thank you very much and over to you rakshit i understand that first 20 minutes you want to share some concepts around consistent compounding to all of us and maybe after that we will open it for more q and a interactive session over to you oh, thank you <clears throat> thanks uh, tarun and uh, thank you and a very warm welcome to everybody uh, thanks for coming over to this session so uh, so let me as tarun mentioned uh, let me let me just share a few few slides uh tarun would it be fair to assume that uh, uh, people in the session uh, will be aware of at least the philosophy and should i just talk about the subject matter here or should i also maybe spend 5 10 minutes on the philosophy of uh, i think you should uh, give some time to philosophy also because i think okay. people would like to know that many are a beginner here also yeah okay fine yeah all right so uh Tarun, uh, Tarun gave a bit of background about uh, me as an individual, but Marcellus as a firm. Uh, it's been three years now uh, that we've been set up. Uh, the, the founding team at Marcellus, which is uh, Sora, Pramod, me, and four of uh, four of our other colleagues, uh, all of the seven founders, uh, uh, we had been working together in our pre previous avatars for quite some time. In particular, Sora, Pramod, and me, uh, we've been working together since 2005 beginning. uh it's been it's been almost 17 years now um the uh the the journey of uh, learning to invest in india um, for us started a little over a decade ago and uh, 
as Sarun highlighted, uh, uh, somewhere in 2013-14, we started offering a philosophy on which we wrote our first book called The Unusual Billionaire in 2016. And uh, the other two, uh, Coffee Can Investing in Diamonds in the Dust, uh, were written in 2018 and 2021. Um, uh, today at Marcellus, uh, across four products, uh, we are managing uh, roughly 13,000 crores in assets. And uh, Consistent Compounders is our flagship product, uh, uh, which was the first product that we, uh, that we offered at Marcellus. Um, in, in terms of the philosophy, broadly speaking, uh, let me very quickly summarize. I'm happy to go into whichever area of detail you want me to in the Q&A. Um, all of our products are trying to benefit from one very uh, uh, attractive aspect of uh, investing in India which actually makes, uh, uh, makes an investor uh, uh, get an arbitrage of low risk, high return. That then very interestingly, uh, uh, beautifully links into the topic of discussion, which is that uh, you don't need to time uh, these types of stocks, which play on, on this, uh, this particular aspect of the Indian economy. Um, so what is that aspect really? Um, it is that India as a country has become a very polarized economy uh, through consolidation of uh, profit share, market share in, uh, in almost all industries over the last uh, decade, decade and a half in particular. Uh, and this uh, consolidation has happened at a very, very rapid and an accelerated pace. Uh, the chart on the right in this slide shows you how uh, the top 20 corporates by profit in India uh, used to contribute to only about say uh, uh, one fifth of the overall corporate profitability of the country uh, measured by top 20,000 corporates of the country. And that number today is, uh, is as high as 80, 90% up from, up from hardly uh, uh, say about 20% a couple of decades ago, uh, right? Uh, now that uh, increase from 20% to 80, 90%, uh, in terms of uh, uh, profits dominated by the top 20 corporates has broadly happened because of three aspects. One, uh, on an infrastructure side, the country has been joined together, which allows uh, companies to scale across geographies uh, better and faster. Uh, this is road infrastructure, telecom, airlines, so on and so forth. Secondly, uh, there have been several events or initiatives events such as say a COVID or the financial crisis that uh, preceded COVID or initiatives such as say the demonetization or GSP that have accelerated this consolidation by uh, literally decimating the unorganized uh, part of various industries and hence allowing larger organized better quality companies to garner more and more shares from unorganized and also weaker organized players. And third aspect is the availability and cost of technology as it has become better and better. Uh, it has allowed, uh, for instance, take for example, Marcellus in its first year of inception was using the same CRM software that a Bajaj Finance also uses. Now we are both in the financial services industry, but there is no comparison between the size, scale and uh, uh, data analytics of Bajaj Finance and what Marcellus does. But in terms of software availability, it was available to us in our first year of inception, right? Which is not something that you could have seen 15, 20 years ago. A startup could not have afforded or accessed uh, a tech uh, platforms, at least, of the of the same uh, uh, same type, same ilk as a as a large corporate, right? Now, as these three teams have played out together, it has ensured that a higher quality companies. They have become significantly more dominant, especially in profit share in their industries compared to what they used to be a decade, decade and a half ago. Now, why does this give an arbitrage of low risk, high return to investors? Think about it like this. This polarization is not unusual. Uh, so far as uh, when you look at the US, uh, Korean, Japanese, European economy, everywhere you see uh, uh, 6, 10, 15, 20 companies controlling. 70% uh, or higher uh, share of the entire economy's corporate profitability. 
so in that regard this sort of a polarization is not unusual every economy has gone through it historically as they have uh, progressed towards uh, a, a, a more developed version but what is uh, uh, unique here is that this is happening when india is still very poor and very large being poor allows you uh, arbitrages around inefficiencies in such a, uh, a, a frequent manner that a high quality corporate can time and again benefit from such inefficiencies to generate returns on capital employed significantly higher than cost of capital which is not something that you can find in a in a rich economy because in the rich economy uh, even if a corporate uh, is is able to find an inefficiency and exploit it uh competition can very quickly replicate that and there aren't too many inefficiencies to periodically keep exploiting right so so to that extent uh, 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 being uh, being poor obviously gives more opportunities to great companies but being large means that you can redeploy the cash that you have generated in too many avenues and hence deliver growth as well you not only need high cash generation you need the cash generation to grow over a period of time right um being large and still poor going through polarization means that if you pick up companies that win under this polarization consolidation uh, uh, theme then those companies will be able to compound free cash flows for you at a very healthy pace not for 3 years or 5 years but for 8 10 15 20 25 20 years or longer right uh, this aspect of longevity that you can get with greatness in india is unique it is not available in the same degree in any other economy globally and provided you capture this aspect not every company in india is going to capture it very few minority of listed corporates will capture it but provided you capture it in your investment portfolio you won't have to take too many risks in order to generate returns because if you are picking up great quality businesses which have already been great to begin with you are not going to be speculating on prevalence of greatness secondly provided you figure out uh, ways and means to convince yourself about sustenance of greatness then the sustenance can be very long and if it is very long you don't have to time entry exit time entry exit repeatedly in these stocks right this is very very important i would say the most difficult part to digest that you can actually get get an arbitrage of low risk high return if you digest this honestly speaking the essence of the session will already be there in your mind because the moment you digest the availability of low risk high return then you obviously don't need to take the timing risk because the fundamentals are low risk by themselves and high return rather than the capital asset pricing model or the uh, usual textbook uh, literature that tells us you can either have low risk low return or high risk high return right this is this is an arbitrage here so so that's i would say the most important piece then rest of it how we build a portfolio many of you might already have heard us if you haven't uh, quick summary Uh, we are very paranoid about accounting quality because if you want if you want to pick up greatness you want greatness to be reflected in the reported numbers you don't want great quality companies understated accounts uh, by siphoning of cash and hence uh, uh, sort of great underlying businesses but nothing for investors to benefit from right so um, uh, and and this is obviously one type of accounting for the other type is the obvious one the usual exciting one the dhfl yes bank etc hollow business but uh, uh, but uh, all overstated accounts uh, uh, according to us accounting fraud is is very very widely prevalent in india if you don't protect yourself from it as a first step then you will first of all waste time working on companies that will not deliver return for you and if you end up holding a fraud in your portfolio you will be sitting on a landmine right then then even timing won't help forget about buy and hold or anything else right mm. um so that uh, that's the first step we have our proprietary fraud detection framework a uh, team of 12 chartered accountants out of the 16 research analysts that we have uh, they've uh, they've 
polish this uh, kept us in good stead and and uh, remains our first step in in filtering out companies what comes out of that filter is then put through historical capital allocation uh, uh, a prudence filter where uh, we do not want companies which don't have a history of healthy uh, 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 earnings compounding healthy free cash flow compounding uh, with a very consistent uh, rate of compounding as well right uh, we want returns on capital to be higher than cost of capital very consistently for time periods as long as 10 10 15 years or longer not on an average every year and revenue growth also to be higher than nominal gdp growth practically every year over a 10 15 year or longer uh, the main reason for this is as long as you have low risk high return uh, opportunities available in india we don't want to speculate on businesses which don't have which don't have any history uh, to teach us about uh, which don't have a great history might have had a very bad history and we are just hoping that there'll be a turn around Uh, businesses which are cyclical volatile and we have to time the cyclicality of their fundamentals we don't want all of that speculation if we can actually generate healthy returns with low risk which we which we believe we can hence this becomes a uh, a sort of uh, a, another way to de risk our uh, our stock selection by filtering out companies which which have not had greatness in the past now having greatness in the past doesn't necessitate greatness in future nothing lasts forever history doesn't repeat itself and hence whatever comes out from the second filter is then put through a research framework where on the left half of the research framework you can see elements where we are trying to do the conventional stuff of assessing greatness prevalence of greatness right um, this is where i would say some value gets added in our research philosophy uh, as in why is it that a unilever uh, retains dominance Uh, by compromising profitability when a patanjali comes in and offers half price product but why is it that an asian paint retains dominance without compromising on profitability even when a when a shervin williams uh, 15 years ago offered five times more dealer margin than asian paints is dealer margin even when a uh, nippon yotun as monopolies in other economies entered india and uh, and decided to spend a lot of money here or a jsw paint three years ago and now grassim is being talked about so on and so forth right why is it that asian paints doesn't have to compromise on profitability uh, whilst uh, uh, retaining dominance in the face of intense competition that's the usual conventional stuff i won't say everybody does it thoroughly but but at least everybody tries makes an attempt to do this what is a very big value add is the right hand half of this slide which is around sustainability of greatness not just prevalence of greatness prevalence we discussed in the last left hand half right the pricing power bit the sustainability of greatness is where we're trying to assess capital allocation decisions which have tangibly been made in the last two or three years around three areas one deepening of the existing core of the business if asian paints is core is uh, supply chain efficiencies then we want to uh, be convinced why in 2025 supply chain efficiencies of asian paints will be better than what they are in 2022 right uh, secondly we want widening of the canvas so not only should your existing core uh, get stronger as time progresses you should also add more elements to the core by adding new revenue growth drivers which also have a very high pricing power and third you need to you need to disrupt yourself you need to radically change the rules of the game for the industry in which you operate so that first and foremost you are the disruptor rather than a new age company coming in then and and uh, redefining the rules of the game secondly your business model is difficult to replicate even in the long run right uh, that is one very very important aspect that we seek in the long run provided a company can show us uh, tangible evidence of capital being invested in these three directions uh, we we uh, tend to build higher conviction in the longevity in the sustainability of greatness right the second aspect of uh, of building conviction around sustainability of greatness is the softer aspect which is we don't want lala ji ki dukan we want an institution now what is the difference between a lala ji ki dukan and an institution a lala ji ki dukan will have a board of directors where uh, 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 friends and family sit on the board as quote and quote independent and they sign off on whatever the lala ji has to do with the business we don't want that 
even if the underlying business is a very high quality but a uh, 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 board is not independent it hampers longevity it hampers sustainability of greatness uh, right um, the second level at which we want an institution building to to be visible to us is um, is senior management roles right these should be people uh, who who were identified as prospective uh, uh, successors to cxos 5 7 3 years in advance and then groomed into those roles rather than having a firm where uh, when the cxo retires or resigns uh, the firm is scrambling around to hunt for a replacement right we don't want that and obviously at a ground level the third step is uh, is where we want uh, uh, where we want uh, systems and processes uh, sorry there's some disturbance um, so we want systems and processes to execute uh, the 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 business at a ground level rather than uh, uh, rather than sort of ad hocism right so this is the this is the uh, approach towards portfolio construction what comes out and now uh, we'll we'll start talking about the topic of uh, uh, timing etc etc what comes out of our approach is a portfolio which has delivered free cash flow compounding in the past and is expected to deliver in future of around mid 20s with no volatility so look at the 20 year compounding and then break the 20 year down into either 5 year blocks or 10 year blocks you will see the same degree of consistency of healthy rate of compounding of free cash flow for for these companies right um, even including the last 5 years which um, I, i i previously highlighted they've been actually very disruptive in some sense right uh, demonetization gst uh, covid these are all events because of which nifty sensex delivered a low single digit earnings growth the broader economy slowed down in particular b2c companies got disrupted but our portfolio which is also pretty much all b2c it actually thrived it thrived with a very healthy rate of growth even in the most difficult of external environment when the uh, going was easy obviously uh, 2006 to 11 tells you something or 6, 11 to 16 the the run rate of fundamental compounding is is equally healthy now that then translates into the share price compounding which is a table on the right right uh, there is a one is to one correlation between table on the left and table on the right for every time period that one is to one correlation is making the timing aspect redundant if you really see right as long as table on the left delivers for these companies table on the right is just an outcome which will certainly be there you don't have to time entry exit right in order to get healthy compounding now if there is no gap between table on the left and table on the right interestingly even the sort of quote and quote uh, 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 things have become more expensive than what they used to be wo question bhi aata nahi right because if the gap increases between fundamentals and valuations so obviously you 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 need to ask the question that uh, uh, valuations have run ahead of fundamentals so are we in the overpriced or fairly valued zone or are we still undervalued here actually it's not that case now having said that when you look at the the quote and quote pe multiple right which i'm sure many of you will be of uh, 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 many of you will be interested in in asking questions around that because when you time you time the pe right typically when you look at the pe multiple there are two aspects to it uh, for some of these companies over the last 10 years pe multiple has gone up secondly as of today the absolute value pe so whatever one year forward is something like 60 times or something uh, it it looks big big rich whatever you call it right so uska kya kare one some pe's have gone up second in an absolute way today's pe look look rich right so uh, there are uh, there are a couple of uh, ways to to understand that uh, right where uh, if you see uh, if you see this slide right look at a consistent gap between free cash flow compounding and earnings compounding right earnings have compounded over the last 10 15 years in the high teens closer to 20% for our portfolio right 
but for every time period you see free cash flow compounding being being around 10 11% higher than earnings growth right now why does this happen and what effect does it have on the pe multiple is uh, is is one point which uh, two points rather which uh, which are worth dwelling deeper on why does this happen so what are the sources of uh, sources of uh, free cash generation right there are four broadly speaking uh, you can you can generate free cash flows through volume or through margin expansion which is profitability and hence profit after tax or earnings or e in the be or there are actually two more doesn't stop at e you can compress working capital cycles consistently you can expand asset turnover consistently asset turnover expansion can happen either through increase in productivity because of robotics or better processes in the manufacturing plants etc uh working capital cycles can be compressed using more tech automation uh, faster collection of uh, of debtors uh, 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 lower inventory so on and so forth right uh, now uh, can companies do this really consistently after e can working capital cycles be consistently compressed as their turns consistently increase is the next bit right so let's go by example so in asian paint uh, Sales growth fourteen percent, margin expansion four percent, profit growth roughly high teens in the last fifteen years. That's not mid twenties. What is mid twenties? Add to it working capital reduction and asset turn expansion. Why has this happened? Uh, uh, if you really see, Asian Paints has has all in house manufacturing. You read the blogs of not just people like SAP and uh, and 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 the larger tech players even if you look at niche uh, uh, manufacturing tech oriented vendors on their websites you will see uh, uh, patents being displayed with asian paints that they have worked on uh, or services provided to asian paints all of those reducing the 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 the, the, the cycle times of manufacturing processes increasing efficiencies by 10% 15% each year year after year you would see such initiatives you read annual reports of asian paints and look at asset turns as as a result uh, the automation the process improvement that keeps happening on a very consistent basis in asian paints is manufacturing is actually a remarkable thing and it is nowhere close to saturation yet um, on top uh, working capital obviously asian paints is a king of that uh think about it this is this is, this is uh, about a retailer right this is uh, this is titan and uh, a very similar story as as asian paint revenue and earning only 18 20% but massive value add through working capital now for a retailer working capital is the most difficult thing to manage for those of you who run uh, large retail or analyze large retail businesses would know that and hence actually the greatest quality retailer is one You can actually make the that challenge uh, their strength, right? Which is what Titan has done. It you can see the plus seven percent consistently over the last fifteen years, and decrease in uh, capex to CFO. This is Page Industries. A very quick uh, example to to make you understand uh, the asset turn part of uh, Via Page. So over the last ten years, average volume of innerwear produced per unit labor workforce, right? Volume of product. Per unit labor workforce for page for jockey has gone up at a rate of five to six percent, right? What that means is, uh, if hundred year if if ten years ago hundred units were produced by X number of uh, laborers, today the same X number of laborers are actually producing uh, uh, roughly double, right? Uh, way more than way more than hundred, and that in effect means the capex required. to grow revenues by a certain quantum is uh, is reducing which you see in the decrease in capex to cfo and uh, and again uh, uh, we are nowhere close to saturation because uh, 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 in hassan in karnataka in hassan uh, page has just launched its first automated manufacturing plant so if the automation goes through increases in proportion you can imagine how this is decrease in capex to cfo will go higher and higher right now if free cash flow compounding as a result Goes at uh, at these uh, 
these run rates, then what you will get in effect is uh, something which you need to understand via this. So uh, the fair value of any company, right? Uh, Non-debatable definition is that it is the present value of all expected future tax flows, right? Uh, this definition cannot be debated again. Somebody can easily debate P multiple, dekhe ki price to book, dekhe ki EV, bitta, dekhe ki price to sales, dekhe, or book kaise dekhe. 10 times steep, hai ki 40 times rich, hai ki kya hai, right? You can always debate those things. What you cannot debate against is that fair value is the present value of all expected future cash flows, right? Now, about future cash flows, there are two elements. One is the rate of compounding. And the second very important element is the longevity of compounding. Right. If you see, let's say scenario one is a company where the rate of compounding is 25%, but the longevity is five years because you don't know. You don't know after five years, if there'll be another Patanjali attack, which will kill profitability, or if the CEO changes, if the promoter goes to succession, if uh, the next GSTD monetization or a blockchain as a technology comes or something else happens, you don't know whether the greatness will be sustained. Right. Uh, that's, that's the reason why you'll have a reduced longevity to your expectations. Whereas if you have greater longevity, just see what difference it makes to the fair value, which is the column in the extreme right. The fair value between high longevity and low longevity, the difference is massive, right? This is what you play for in a high quality company. So why did you are playing for this? Whether you buy a, a 245 times PE multiple at 30 times or 50 times or 70 times and whether that 70 goes to 30 or 50 in future or whether the 30 goes to 70 in future, it doesn't matter. Your fair valuation uh, is significantly higher than the current price. You're buying an undervalued stock and the share price will follow, will follow okay. the fun fundamentals like, like this slide show. The share price will keep following fundamentals and and you will get the outcome of fundamental compounding. So, so that's, I'll stop here. Uh, rest of it, I mean, I, I probably know the portfolio through these slides already. It's a 14 stock portfolio that we have um, and happy to answer questions that you get, Tarun. So, thank you. Thank you, Rakshit. Uh, I think interestingly, two years back also, we did a similar session with you and I think like one of our attendee, Kunal has mentioned that uh, last two years, nothing has changed. You have been completely consistent and that uh, proves that uh, you have a lot of confidence on your philosophy. Otherwise, I've seen a lot of fund managers who keep changing with times, right? Their philosophy keeps changing. So I think uh, congratulations on ensuring that you are consistent in that, that part. I think, Rakshit, my uh, bigger question is... Uh, Last three, four years, we have seen almost, uh, almost 40 plus AAA rated defaults in the country, right from ZTV to uh, DHFL to, uh, I think there are many corporates who have defaulted, right? I think, uh, I think this again talks about something very interesting called value traps. And uh, though it looks amazing that uh, you you have a lot of parameters to pick up company, but there are many times where you get into all these value traps. So when investors sometimes romanticize a, a, a particular stock and stick it for long term only to see a deliver appreciation or marginal appreciation, how do you separate actual long term compounders from these value traps? Maybe some science you have built around those value traps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot of signs. So, um, look, first and foremost, I'll, I'll just leave aside the discussion on debt market defaults. I'm not a debt analyst, but let me just put it this way. Uh, an Asian bank doesn't issue debt. A Dr. Lal Path Labs doesn't issue debt, right? Uh, if you're going to the debt market, corporate debt market, by default, you will not get the highest cash generating companies. Highest cash generating, the highest quality companies might not be in the debt market. Obviously, Bajaj Finance issuing debt is a very great opportunity, but uh, but you won't have TCS issuing corporate debt, right? So, uh, so first and foremost, uh, when you go to the corporate debt market, my understanding, and I am not an expert on that market, is that you are starting on the back foot to begin with, if 
you are picking up high quality fundamentals as a way of making money there are always too many ways to make money in both equities as well as debt right harvard marx has made great amount of money by picking up com- debt of companies which are close to bankruptcy and then turning it around right so there are different different uh, investors there are different approaches uh, but if you are picking up fundamental compounding as a way to make money i doubt if debt market will give you the best quality uh, that's that's to begin with uh, answer to your question the second is there there's a lot of accounting fraud as i previously mentioned and the first piece of science to answer your question is that uh, is that accounting fraud uh, uh, part right so um, you won't uh, 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 you won't easily digest this until you see it in annual reports how frequently this is done right the number of red flags that we see if we do if you put a screener of bsc 500 uh, uh, accounting screener on bsc 500 there literally no more than 80 90 100 companies in any year that pass the test of having no red flag in their accounts most companies have red flags that is where i would say the biggest element of risk of unexpected suddenly some landmine bursting in your portfolio as i said uh, happens right so the first piece of time is to be very 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 uh, uh, paranoid about accounting fraud right it's all right to miss a great compounder which had a red flag but it was a justified red flag you stayed away from it because of the red flag and you missed it it's all right that's a that's a small mistake to make but ignoring a red flag sitting on it and then that bursting into your face is a massive mistake you can't recover from it right so so that's that's the first part of science the second part of science is the research framework which i which i showed you that yeah here you can see this this research framework has to be applied in a very rigorous way you cannot apply it once and forget it it is just not possible that things will remain unchanged right uh, we we have exited from companies in the last four years because when we bought them they had a different scoring on this framework but things changed and we decided to sell them there are going to be such changes in future as well and we have to be on top of everything tomorrow uh, i i briefly mentioned this tomorrow the blockchain has a new technology comes it could change the way banking is done it could change the way supply chains are functioning it could change the way a customer acquisition is carried out by sales marketing so on and so forth god knows where the changes will be what we cannot assume is that just because uh, uh, over the last 20 years our portfolio companies have been on top of tech, tech evolution in future as well they will be we cannot assume that we need tangible evidence right so that even if we miss out on timing the exit we don't miss it out by more than say 6 months or a year uh, we are not sitting for 5 years on something that has already become a weak pricing for our company but we are just holding it because it used to be a great pricing for in the past so that that's one very very important piece uh, uh, which is where i mean if you really see we have a team of 16 analysts today and we have a holding uh, uh, exposure to no more than 3 3 and a half dozen companies right those 16 analysts in some ways you can say why do you need such a big team we always fall short of bandwidth to stay up to date Uh, 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 on on everything that is happening around the around the ecosystems of our portfolio companies, right? There's a lot on which you have to keep yourself updated. If you don't put science to it, there will be biases, right? And our science actually is more gravitated towards math, so that even the quality of management, quality of board of directors is poor. These are qualitative aspects. If you don't quantify them, then biases come in, and biases. are one of the problems in that you have in a way highlighted in your question why would you hold a stock and sleep over it uh, probably because you were biased right uh, you need to overcome these biases one of the best ways to do that is to quantify everything and then have a have a way in which your colleagues can challenge you have a process to which colleagues can challenge you and you stay alive and awake to everything that is happening with the holding company so 
so another very important question i think rakshit we discussed this in the past also i think uh, uh, maybe the 15 20 companies which you would be owning uh, if i as a investor have to look at most of the uh, uh, various mutual fund or portfolios I, i i'll run through will have the similar kind of companies and i think uh, while asking this question you gave a very interesting insight on portfolio returns versus uh, stock selection i think that was one very important observation you made right ki why mm-hmm. it is very important to look at portfolio returns and sizing and rebalancing on a regular basis i think there are a lot of uh, data points uh, you, and science behind this exercise also how do you size a stock if you pick up a asian paints how much percentage of the portfolio you'll pick up if that stock will go 200% how will you rebalance it which as a normal investor we don't do maybe th- you can share some gems uh, around that part rebalancing and sizing yeah so um, so first and foremost uh, um, as you said while every portfolio will have a bajaj finance and an asian paints the difference is we have it as 10 11 12% allocation somebody else will have it as 2 3 4% because we have only 14 stocks in the portfolio somebody else will have 40 50 60 70 100 200 stocks in the portfolio secondly uh, how much weight you give even within a 14 stock portfolio how much weight is given to the top 3 stocks versus the bottom 3 which are those stocks and how do those weights change in future over time is also very important if these factors don't contribute to returns you will leave on the table at least 3 to 5% uh, on an annualized basis which you could have grabbed through uh, a position sizing and portfolio construction right so uh, when it comes to for instance uh, uh, portfolio concentration whether you should have 12 stocks or 15 or 20 or 5 or 50 right um, the simple way to answer that uh, 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 that part of the question is uh, think of it, think of it like this if uh, so so this is from a newsletter we published if let's say your coverage universe had uh, the characteristic now whatever is the characteristic you are measuring every philosophy will have a different somebody will say mere ko characteristic chahiye uh, uh, turn around hona chahiye tadakta bhadakta kuch uh, uh, badalna chahiye somebody else will say mere ko characteristic chahiye uh, uh, like we have consistent component somebody else will say mere ko characteristic chahiye valuation sasti honi chahiye p multiple pe aur aur mere ko usme expansion expected chahiye right whatever there are different characteristics you pick up in a stock when you buy it right we pick up fundamentals defined in a certain way as i said through the research framework uh, uh, somebody else picks up something else if the characteristic in your uh, entire coverage universe has a has a flat gradient then the more number of stocks you own the better it is because every incremental stock ownership will not bring down the quality of your portfolio but it will certainly add to the diversification benefit okay so more number of stocks the better and hence you just have to then look where the gradient is starting to go down wherever it goes down you cut an axe put an axe there and build a portfolio in this chart let's say it's talking about stock 30 because after 30 the gradient is starting to fall right and the dotted line is showing you the risk reward right now unfortunately in india you don't have a flat gradient at least in fundamentals in fundamentals you have a very steep gradient this is a hypothetical chart not representative of our coverage universe but in our coverage universe you have such a steep gradient so our coverage universe is of 25 stocks somebody else is might be 40 Uh, uh our coverage universe is of 25 stocks those 25 stocks have a very steep downward sloping gradient right uh, as a result having all 25 is worse than having top 20 by quality that is worse than having top 15 top 10 top 5 but having only five stocks only three stocks is also very high risk because as i said things are evolving very fast for these companies right we try to stay up to date as much as we can 
but we still might make mistakes you have to give some uh, risk mitigating tools to the portfolio for those types of risk and and hence you need certain diversification for sure um you need to quantify those risks once you quantify those risks hamare problem kya hai most investors they treat only return right theoretically they say yeah 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 i want risk adjusted return i'll look at sharp ratio are but sharp ratio standard deviation these are not the correct measures of risk think about it if the promoter of a company has never died in the past then succession planning is not something that has played out in the share price of that company in the past So you can't quantify it basis share price standard deviation share price sharp ratio and say that I have considered all risks in my portfolio. There are certain risks which are never played out in the share price historically. Hence, historical share price cannot tell you risk measurement for that particular stock. Se- secondly, there are certain risks you don't want to avoid because they are upside risks, right? Risk r- risk doesn't necessarily mean only downside. Risk is on the upside as well. so if there is a company with high risk bulk of it which is upside risk very little is downside risk then you don't need to avoid that so so risk measurement itself is a science i would say done properly will give you the risk reward gradient and once you've got the risk reward gradient in a downward sloping characteristic score you will yourself get the answer where should be the optimal number of stocks that you should hold in the portfolio so that you are diversified at the same time Not diluting the quality, and this is a very big value add. I mean, people people believe stock selection is it. That's it. What is investing? Investing is equal to picking up uh, 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 the stocks that you want. No, building a portfolio adds several extra layers to the performance and the risk of the performance, right? Uh, which uh, which is very important. So that that's one piece, which is portfolio concentration. The second piece is position sizing. uh so position sizing is once you've defined that let's say in our case it's a 12 to 15 stock portfolio that you want to build then in a 12 to 15 stock portfolio uh we as i said we score every company on all those attributes all those parameters and then those attributes are uh, uh are interplayed with each other some of them are treated as critical factors some are treated as substitutable factors some attributes are in geometric progression some are in arithmetic progression to give an outcome which then gives you a very clear measured way to define whether uh, asian paints with lower expected growth but higher un- uh, higher certainty of growth how should you weigh that in the portfolio compared to say a bajaj finance with higher expected growth but compared to asian paints maybe a little lower certainty of growth in particular about the management and all right board board quality etc so in those aspects uh, i would say uh, uh, you need to then weigh the portfolio which stock gets what sort of a weight on an ongoing basis as things change these weights need to change they need to reflect those changes and hence all of these changes then then feed into your return now let me give you an example of how this position sizing works very beautifully so uh 2020 march and april right bajaj finance fell by 65% i think from some closer to 5000 rupees a share to less than 2000 rupees a share uh in our portfolio broadly speaking nothing has fell right everything else remained within plus 10 or minus 10 of their first march 2020 share prices right so so the the nestle abbott and uh, dr lal etc they went up the asian paint type they fell by 5% or whatever when the market fell by 30 35% now because bajaj finance had fallen by 65 nothing else had fallen in our portfolio bajaj finances allocation dropped to roughly a third of what it was pre covid okay at that time if you are not clear in your mind around the, the 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 conviction on fundamentals and then the portfolio construction you might actually make the cardinal mistake of stop loss this is actually the worst thing that you can do in a high conviction portfolio either you have no conviction and then stop loss is a way to 
de-risk your portfolio from uh, wrong companies picked up because you never had conviction on them. Or you say, I have conviction, in which case stop loss is the, the, the biggest mistake you can ever make. Right? So uh, rather than triggering a stop loss, what ideally you should have done and we did at Marcellus is you should have said, well, this is an opportunity. Uh, every other stock in the portfolio, their allocation has gone up because Bajaj Finance's allocation has gone down. Total to 100, yeah, na? 100 doesn't change. Right? Uh, at that time, shave off 1-2% each from some of the stocks which have gone up to buy 5-6-7% of Bajaj Finance, which is what we did. We tripled the Bajaj Finance allocation. In uh, we, we were lucky. We did it broadly around the bottom, but forget about even if it was a Daisa rupee a share rather than below 2000, it would have worked wonders. And it did work wonders. It added, it added massive. I think if you do simple math, it will tell you it added more than 4 5% in that year to that one event to our portfolio returns, right? Now, these are massive value adds and they don't happen very infrequently, obviously. The Bajaj Finance type of example of 2020 is maybe once in five years, once in 10 years, but smaller variants of this keep happening very frequently, right? They will be stocks which go on a holiday, uh, despite fundamentals doing very well. So Dr. Lal Path Labs went on a holiday in 2017 and 18 for two years. Uh, 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 and, uh, and Page Industries went on a holiday for a couple of years. Right. Uh, 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 there are several stocks in our portfolio currently, which you can argue have been on a holiday for the last one year. So stocks go on a holiday. It's okay. Right. But you can benefit from that by rebalancing. Buy more of them if you are really convinced about the fundamentals when they go on a holiday. Sell more, or sell a little bit of them if they've run up too fast compared to everything else in the portfolio. This rebalancing exercise adds massive, uh, massive uh, 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 value to the overall portfolio. So Rakshit, I think very interesting perspective. I think we are again running out of time, but I just want to make again a do it yourself investor versus a, a proper portfolio management approach, which we are talking about. How do one manage their emotions, right? When a Bajaj finance came 2000 or when Bajaj finance today is at 8,000 rupees, I think as a, a there, there is a lot of bias, which comes into it, right? So I think which I have seen normally in do it yourself investor there, 10% of the holding is now 60% of the portfolio. It has gone up so much that it takes 50, 60% of the portfolio and client is, or investor is clueless what to do with that. Right? So this is like a major problem I have seen with, with the direct equity portfolios of a lot of clients. So what is your suggestion? How, how can that be managed by them? Right? What are the principles? I think you did spoke about some of them, but any, any, any specific suggestions you would like to give? Well, there are, uh, let me put it this way. You have to be clear. Uh, do you want the, the deep research approach towards high quality stock selection, or do you want the, the not so deep research approach, right? If you are following the not so deep approach, then obviously you have to do stop loss. Right, you have to do stop loss. Niche mein, upar mein. It's okay, you let go of some, you sell out of Bajaj Finance in uh, March 2020. It's okay, but you will at least make something right, uh, from somewhere else. Maybe I don't know, you might not be able to get a 20 25% compounding. To aai jai. You'll be able to beat Nifty if you are at least doing, let's say, accounting fraud filtering. So, uh, there, are, uh, there are two different ways to pick up a stock basis fundamentals. One way is I know the fundamentals very well. Or uh, when they change, I have the process to figure out the strength of the fundamentals as they are changing, right? So for instance, we, we were obviously very uh, 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 anxious to an get answers to questions around Bajaj Finance's unsecured books when COVID was happening. But to get those answers, you need some process so that over a, a four or five week time period, you can get those answers to reasonable degree. You will never get transparent answers, uh, 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 but you should have a process to figure out the answers. If you don't have that process, then do equal weight, use stop loss, have at least a 30, 40 stock portfolio are, the, are some of the tools. But if you have a process, then uh, the process takes care of it. Great. So uh, Rakshit, there's another interesting question by Mr. Sunil 
that uh, the historical data demonstrated in the slides had happened over a period where the equity culture was quite low, thereby the average PE multiples being on a lower side. Currently, the equity being a preferred investment destination and PE multiples at all time high, are you still confident about keeping up the performance and CAGR of CCP portfolio, especially for investors who may enter at current price current price and trust me rakshit this is a common dilemma a lot of investors are facing how would you like to address this question yeah the simple way to address it is just this this uh, uh, the, the bible the gita the quran the grant of valuation is free cash flow right there is nothing more important to valuation than free cash flow if the free cash flow compounding historically has not lagged behind share price compounding to begin with even before you start doing research you don't have to be worried okay so the notion hai pe multiple has gone up right ye pehle hi galat notion prove ho jata hai if the free cash flow to share price ratio free cash flow yield basically hasn't changed right so so that's uh, that's that's one piece uh, which which is a way to answer the question there is another very interesting way to again demystify this pe multiple ki obsession right uh, think of it like this uh, uh, ye jo aapko maine wo ek dusra ek slide dikhaya tha jisme earnings growth of some companies which are particularly tech investment oriented companies earnings growth lagged behind free cash flow growth by 10% for every time period in the last 10 15 years why is that happening because that is making the pe multiple in a way a redundant factor why because agar aapka pe multiple pe numerator is being driven of free cash flow whether i said gita granth whatever bible etc is 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 free cash flow for valuation numerator is price price is driven of free cash flow if the denominator is driven of earning which lags behind free cash flow compounding by 10 percentage points then the pe multiple obviously will expand right so why has the pe multiple for some companies expanded in the last 10 15 years is it a reversible factor or is it an irreversible factor very very important question you need to answer for yourself now let me give you a a corollary here so uh, for those of you who are obsessed about pe multiple i'm sure you've read intelligent investor by benjamin graham uh, the whole book talked about price to book price to book price to book price to book there was no mention of price to earning cash flow ye wo because at that time book value was the biggest driver of free cash flow right at that time if a png had warehouses factories depots it could invest in physical assets it could deliver growth product differentiation these were the drivers of competitive advantages at that time right this is i'm talking about 40s 50s 60s then came an a phase where png said are there is massive media naam ki nayi cheez aayi hai brand banate hain to png brand banane lag gaya so manufacturing started getting outsourced distribution outsourced the differentiation shifted to intangible such as say a brand and book value started becoming a uh, an irrelevant factor for free cash generation right because png stopped building more factories and more depots and more warehouses to grow cash it said yaar outsource karo factory factory nahi chahiye khud ki brand banao brand bana diya uh, maal apne aap bikega and we'll derive earning so pe multiple came into came into light right because price to book to expand hi karta gaya why because earnings growth was far faster than book value growth and earnings growth was the same as free cash flow growth right so on a price to book multiple numerator was driven off earnings but denominator was driven off book value denominator didn't grow numerator was growing there was a whole breed of investors who did not accept this adopt to this they kept harping about price to book price to book price to book kyunki zindagi mein price to book hi dekha tha tab tak ab price to book badhta ja raha hai expensive ho gaya expensive ho gaya and they didn't invest in a png i'm talking about the us right uh, 
but not for every company for lenders banks nbfcs even today price to book is a decent i would say approach provided book value is the moat for that lender right so for some companies not for all the multiple quote and quote which is a derived ratio it is not a grunt it is a derived ratio the multiple change in the last 10 15 years the way technology has evolved for some companies again not for all that grunt is changing i mean the the, the multiple uh, that you should look at is again changing its face so you need to be a little conscious of that so that's the second way to to look at it third way is that look if your free cash flow compounding is in the 20s let the pe have here yeah. let's say pe multiple is relevant for that company okay. let it have what will be the worst case over a five year period having of pe is 12 13% negative annually right over a five year period the pe has i think it's uh, 13% negative something like that right so or maybe 13 and a half 14 so so if your pe has over a five year period but your free cash flow compounding is 25% or fundamentals compounding is 25% then your share price compounding will still be in the early teens at least over a five year period over a 10 year period it will be in the high teens right now think about it if your portfolio company with 25% fundamental compounding is undergoing pe having imagine what would be happening to the rest of the market where fundamental compounding is only 10% wo to dharti mein ghus jayega wo right just like just like hamara wo covid crash mein our portfolio companies went through a correction but the market went through even more correction so aisa kabhi nahi hoga ki 10% fundamental compounder is undergoing pe expansion and your 25% fundamental compounder is undergoing pe compression nahi hoga wo right wo thoda adbhut hai so so don't worry about those things uh, your fundamental compounding being healthy is a very very good defense to have a very good defense to have right a powerful engine but ghise hue tires right can do a decent job at least in your car ride a weak engine with fresh ekdam badhiya chamakte hue tires can't take you up up the hill i hope uh, sunil ji you got your answer uh, so uh, i think last two questions uh, we will have before that i am just running a quick poll uh, my request to everyone before we take these two questions kindly take this poll because i think these poll will also give us some perspective about your approach to investing so my request kindly take this poll quickly take this poll four questions only so rakshit we have very interesting question in this poll one is uh, we know that investment return versus investor return maine normally dekha hai ki investment ne 15% return diya 20 saal ka nifty return but when i look at average mutual fund portfolios of client the investor return is poor by 4 5% and uh, that is to do with a lot of thing on holding period right so we are asking what is the normal holding pe- period uh, in which with which you invest in a stock or a fund and i think we are getting almost 59% people has more than 3 years this is a good news for us so what is the preferred approach of investing timing the market versus buy and hold 33% feel that uh, buy and hold for extraordinary long periods of time is a good approach 67% still feel that combination approach based on personal view again this is another view which has come in 
third question based on your understanding of today's session do you feel investing in good companies regardless of overvaluation based on traditional parameter pe pb will yield greater returns in the long run or not i think 78% feel yes great companies always give great return which you have also mentioned in your talk so thank you very much i think quickly i think uh, rakshit couple of questions one is uh, more around uh, the global trend around passive investing and there is a huge noise across media across uh, a lot of influencers are talking about uh, indexing and i think we have seen in indian study also 70 80% of the large cap fund managers are not able to beat index what do you see uh, again i want you to look at going forward 5 to 10 years again from a fund management industry point of view what do you see how do you see the industry will pan out will industry will be 80% into more index oriented and 20% more boutique people who knows how with a very strong conviction how do you see going forward 5 to 10 years equity investing in industry well the answer has to come uh, basis uh, uh, another question which is will uh, uh, will active fund managers uh continue to underperform the the broader index right so as you said there are some factors because of which uh, a, 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 an active retail investor as well as an active fund manager uh, in many cases historically has has underperformed in india if that continues so that's an assumption that i am putting on the table if uh, the underperformance continues then yeah yeah I mean, we'll go the vanguard the 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 etf the black rock the index investing way no doubt about it why would you pay a fund manager uh, if 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 they can't even beat the index and following the index obviously with technology now uh, uh, for, uh, doing index investing can come at very cheap rates so you can do that so 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 depends on which way the the fund management community uh, and their uh, uh, services products and services they they go in terms of differentiating vis-a-vis -vis index return um having said that let me put it this way uh beating an index and delivering healthy absolute as well as relative return once you deliver healthy absolute return relative to ho hi jayega apne aap and healthy absolute in my definition is 18 20% of uh if you are delivering healthy absolute 18 to 20% or higher then in any case you don't need to worry about beating the index you will beat the index no doubt about it uh, can you deliver 18 20% or higher uh, i think in the next 10 15 years india gives you a better opportunity than it ever did right uh, first and foremost i would say uh, 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 go back to the polarization theme the consolidation theme that i was talking about secondly Uh, we are going through a very very interesting inflection point of uh, of of sort of tech intervention into various industries right which will only accelerate this polarization further which will only accelerate the cash generation of high quality companies further right and thirdly i would say uh, there's enough degree of under appreciation of sustainability of greatness that the high quality companies will remain very cheap compared to their intrinsic value even though optically they might look on a particular pe or pb multiple somewhere right they will remain incredibly cheap and hence the opportunity to benefit from undervaluation in stocks is uh, is remarkable provided we don't make mistakes in in portfolio construction and stock selection right so so that's uh, that's all obviously an assumption so uh, 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 for you as an investor honestly speaking you don't need to worry about which way the market will go as long as you know how to deliver that 18 20% or higher if you know how to do 18 20% or higher let the market become 80% index how, how does it matter to you right? you will get your you will get your return Rakshit, I think uh, last question, and I would like to end with it. 
I uh, we would like to know Rakshit as a person more, right? I think last twenty years. So, what's your secret sauce, right? You have been a, uh, uh, your your funds have been performing amazingly. Uh, I think uh, I think there has something which has gone behind it, right? So, what are the inputs? We want to know some secret sauce for some budding investors like us, right? Who are looking at investing into good successful companies. Any piece of advice or anything based on your experience you would like to share with us? well uh, i mean you are combining two things which i would say are not uh, aligned which is me as an individual and uh, the fund performance of the products on which i have worked uh, they are not they are not perfectly aligned why because uh, the performance of whatever we have delivered so far what whatever we will deliver in future uh, uh, and i am not making this up it's uh, it's not just me it's a team uh, it's a team and hence doesn't matter i'm a, i'm a punjabi by uh, by my background it doesn't matter how 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 my behavior is it might be uh, like a typical punjabi or like a, 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 like i would say a, a, a different variant it doesn't matter how i am who i am what have i done uh, because the outcome that has come here is a team and there i would yes i, I would say yes i've been fortunate to be part of that team i have contributed to that team Uh, uh the the elements which i have benefited from myself uh, i would say are uh, the kind of uh, rigor discipline that i got taught uh, through my colleagues working all these years uh, sort of 15 17 years that we've been working together uh, the motivation that we got uh, by 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 having that the various types of stakeholders all through uh, whether it be colleagues or clients or partners etc uh i mean this might sound like a little bit bookish but it's not bookish as actually that that's how it has worked for me in particular obviously uh, uh i was uh, not so clear about how how i want to pursue investing as a career till uh, say 2013 14 i would say as i have been after 2013 14 so there was a bit of a turning point once that turning point was there the clarity of thought came uh about uh, uh uh how uh i can go deeper and deeper and deeper and since then i have been very passionate about about depth of work uh, uh obviously we also have to do in our jobs a lot of width at times but it's the depth that fascinates me uh which is where again i've i've learned all of this uh, through my colleagues and together when we go deep uh, we realize there are too many unaddressed uh, arbitrages available that we can uh, that we can benefit from uh, so that's really it uh, otherwise yeah i mean if you have fun if you have fun doing what you do you don't have to worry about well i am the i am the 500th fund manager who has come to launch a new fund will it work or not uh, what i am buying everybody has bought an asian paint for 30 years will i really get any extra insight out of doing research on asian paint right uh, uh, so on and so forth i mean you don't you don't get bothered too much by those things once you uh, you figure out why uh, what you what you are doing uh, is, uh, is is around depth and once it is around depth many things are uh, uh, there are arbitrages you will find thank you very much rakshit for uh, uh, all the insights and all the experience sharing i think very helpful super helpful for all of us and uh, uh, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, uh, stay tuned uh, we'll keep doing this every month thank you so much rakshit thank, thank you tarun thanks everyone thank you.